When you're setting the relay, some of the important things to look at are you want to confirm the definition of pickup. Pickup, or PU, could also mean per unit. You have to know what that is. And then you have to know whether the relay is using secondary or primary amps. And then you might have to look at a multiple of per unit rated amps or the CT maximum rating. It's very important to understand how this relay is going to look at that pickup setting that you put in. The other thing you want to do is you want to make sure you use the correct elements. So you could have an element that's called 51G or 51N. Now, if you were a, Schweitzer, uh, a guy who had programmed a lot of Schweitzer 321s in your career, you would think that N means neutral or the residual neutral inside the relay. But if somebody said, all right, I want you to set a 311C relay, which is a different model, it has an N input. So if you actually programmed the 311 relay like a 321, you would actually be programming something that may not actually have an input signal connected to it, and it may not ever work. The other thing that you have to be wary of is that there are limited functions available, and you can make a one-character mistake. If you go back here and you put an OR symbol anywhere here where there's an AND symbol, you just completely changed how that element is going, or how that output logic is going to work, and a one-character mistake can be catastrophic. So when you were talking about engineers setting the relay, they should always use the software to create the settings. And now in 2013, it's also very important that you type in the right model number when you're creating those settings. In 2001, that wasn't that, that big of a deal. But in 2013, it's a huge deal because it's a huge headache for the guy in the field trying to load settings into a relay that where the model numbers of the settings and the model numbers of the relay do not match. You want to check the definition of pickup. Make sure that you understand that if it's a Schweitzer relay, we're just talking about secondary amps. If it's a GE relay, we're usually talking about 5 amps. It's a multiple of 5 amps or 1 amp in outside of North America. Or if it's a uh, Siemens relay, the pickup is really 1.1 uh, times whatever you sent, whatever you set inside the relay. So all of those things, have to you have to understand it as an engineer before you start programming relays. And then you want to compare the I.O. configuration to the drawings to make sure that you're actually programming the right outputs to do the right things. Because if you program output 102 to do something and output 102 is not connected to anything, nothing's going to happen. And then you want to review your event recorder settings because some people don't put that rising edge and falling edge into the equation, which means that the relay is constantly recording events during a, during a fault. So if you have one fault, you could have thousands of events and it's really hard to figure out what happened. Or other people don't do anything with the event record settings and they just leave them at defaults. So when the events happen, the poor guys in the field have no, no way of knowing what happened because the relay wasn't recording anything. When we're talking about relay testers, we want to use software to set up the relay. You don't want to use the front panel unless it's absolutely necessary. You want to compare the input and output settings to the drawings because this is the one of the biggest things that I find that engineers screw up is, and it's usually not their fault, it usually has to do with revision control. That's another thing. You want to make sure you have the latest revision of drawings. And you want to compare, and everything that's wired to an actual device better have logic in it. And everything that has logic in it better be wired to something. That's one of the most important things to check. You also want to make sure that you check the date and time because it's something that's really easy to miss. And you want to never change the password. In 2001, it was a, a big deal for just usability. So if you change the password, the guy after you couldn't test it. But now with uh, NERC and FERC and all the SIPA stuff, you want to make sure that you never change the password because they could, the company that you're working for could get fined if the password is incorrect. So when you're testing a relay, you want to find out what the owner needs. And then you want to, uh, which could be, I want this relay to trip whenever output one operates. And then you want to draw it out. And then you want to compare uh, the drawing to what the owner's needs are. And then you want to review the manufacturer's literature for the appropriate labels. So if you're testing a Schweitzer relay and you're looking for an inverse overcurrent, you're looking for something that's 51. And if it's phase, it, it'll be 51P. And if you want the time delay, it should be 51PT. 
So you got to be perfect about that. If it's a if it's a, a GE relay, then you're looking for a P in the front. That means phase, and then TOC that means inverse. So you're looking for a PTOC one, for example, and then maybe a T at the end of that. You want to review the relay settings to make sure that everything makes sense. So that means comparing, the, making sure everything that's assigned to an output is actually turned on in the in the relay settings part of it. And everything that's turned in turned on in the relay settings is actually assigned to be an output. Then you test each element individually, and we'll go on about how you can test elements in a future video. And then you want to apply the logic scheme. So that means not reprogramming the relay every time you're testing an element. That means that even that you do a timing to at least a timing test on every output that's supposed to operate when that element operates. And then you want to draw the internal logic scheme and compare it to number two, which is what the owner wanted. So that's getting back to, I want to make, if output 101 is set to trip, I want to make sure that output 101 is programmed to trip and, and is connected to the trip circuit. If output 102 is supposed to close, then it better be connected to the closed circuit. And then you want to test each output with every associated element. So if that relay is programmed when you have an inverse time over current to operate outputs 1, 4, and 7, you should be doing a timing test and monitoring output 1. And then another timing test and monitoring output 4. And then another timing test and, output and monitoring output 7. Or if you have a modern relay, you can do that all in one test. But it's very important that if you test all the elements that are turned on, because otherwise you might have a fancy Christmas ornament on the panel where the relay is doing its job, but it's programmed incorrectly and it's not actually closing outputs that are connected to anything in the, in the real world. For the documentation, for engineers, please, please, please use the software to create settings and don't just give us a bunch of sheets and have us enter it because you've just increased the chance of an error. You want to supply a printout as of the final settings as a separate drawing because we don't want to have somebody have to actually talk to a relay to figure out what that relay is supposed to do. It's also, uh, if somebody makes a mistake in the relay and there's no documentation, three years from now, nobody will know that it's wrong and unless it just doesn't operate correctly. And then you want to create a drawing of the output logic that anyone can understand. So it usually they draw it out as logic diagrams, but it could be an electrical schematic, as I've shown earlier in the paper. For testers, make sure you document the nameplate data, including the ratings and the serial number and the product number. You want to do a pickup and a timing of each element. You want a result for each output. And then you want a copy of the final settings with your report so that if somebody comes and changes those relay settings after you leave, you can document and say, no, this is how I left it. Somebody must have come in after me and changed it. And you want to write down the password, but this is kind of tricky in 2013. So uh, make sure that you know what the SEPA requirements are for, the, for wherever you are and whether it's okay to write down that password. Because in 2001, that wasn't a big deal. In 2013, cybersecurity is a big deal. So that was the very, very, very first paper that I ever wrote and is the basis of the Relay Testing Handbook, or it was the beginning of it anyway in 2001. I have uh, linked a copy to the paper in the, in the credits below, so you can go down and make comments if you want and go download the paper. But if you already have the Relay Testing Handbook version 1, or actually the Output Logic section, or the Complete Handbook, that is so much better than what this paper is. So... Uh, thank you very much for watching the video, and I hope that we can uh, connect together later for future videos. Thank you, and have a great day.